This is your semi-regular reminder that Science Sort of is recorded using Zencaster. That's Z-N-C-A-S-T-R dot com. Go to Zencaster dot com and use the coupon code SCIENCE to get 20% off your first three months or your entire year if you sign up for an annual plan. If you or your organization would have any benefit from having meetings recorded over a Skype-like protocol, but with everyone on their own tracks, definitely consider giving Zencaster a try. We've been really happy with it, and we think you will be too. This isn't really an ad, but they did give us a promo code, so we wanted to let you guys know about it in case it comes in handy for you. Thanks. All right, Ben, go ahead and do the intro. How, how does it go? I don't know. Welcome I haven't done it a sort of. What's that? <laughs> All right, I'll just... I don't, it's all muscle memory to me at this point, so I can't articulate it. I can only no, do it. I can't, I can't quite grab it tonight. I can literally only perform it in a performative aspect. I can't actually just say what it is. So I'll just go ahead and perform it since you're being a failure. Okay. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Science Sort Of. No, wait. That's right. Hello. Hello and welcome to Science Sort Of. <laughs> I'm Ryan Hot. No, that you never just say that. I forget. From ScienceSortOf.com, you're listening to Science Sort Of. Science sort of our theme this week is the end of small things. I am your host, Ryan Haupt, and joining me to talk about things that are science, things that are sort of science, and things that wish they were science is King Pika himself, Ben Tippett. Hello, everybody. Good evening. And we've had him as a guest on the show before, but joining us for the first time as a co-host is Matt Canadensis. Did I do that right? <laughs> yeah, close. <laughs> Candace, thanks for having me. Candace, sorry, the Canadian screwed me up, and well, I was, was like, that is honestly he... not on purpose. It was not on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking about Canada a lot in that moment. <laughs> for the amount of times someone has completely butchered that, that is the best one I've ever gotten. Kudos to you. Because I, I was just thinking, like, what's a taxon that would be from Canada? It'd be Canadensis. Certainly, yeah. I'll take it. And then I, then I screwed everything up from there. I'm from Buffalo, so kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Buffaloensis. Oh, ooh, ooh. Bisonensis. Bisonensis. Something like that. Gorilla, gorilla. Anyway, Matt, you are the host of In Defense of Plants. That is correct. Your one-stop shop for all the botany that needs defending. Yes, curing plant blindness one episode at a time. I don't know what plant blindness is. Maybe you could maybe you could define that term for us, because that's a curious term to me. Right. So in our field, plant blindness refers to the fact that when people go outside, they see a big green wall and they look at it and go, mm, that's all the same thing. And it's just kind of a way of saying they don't really take time to realize that plants are different from one another and that they're organisms that are living, breathing, having sex and fighting. Well, all right. Yeah. Ben, are you being blind to plants? Yes, I'm entirely blind to plants. Hey, uh, Matt. Yo. Can you settle a long running dispute uh, like in my life, my my uh, my plant blind life? I can try. Is pond scum, you know, like the algae that grows in like ponds and stinky? Right. Is that seaweed? Can I call that seaweed? Because I have been no. since I was a kid. Absolutely not. No, nah, that's like calling a, a gall a seagull. You just can't. There are other kinds of galls, Ben. Like like Ducat or <laughs> 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 Edit that out. <laughs> Tim, edit that out. <laughs> no one must know that I've watched Deep Space Nine. <laughs> uh, but we know. We know. <laughs> Yeah, not all gulls are seagulls, Ben. Is that so? Yeah, yeah seaweed. Are there like desert gulls? And oh, okay. Yeah, seaweed is just kind of a catch-all for a green thing floating in water. But uh, yeah, right. Yeah, but it should be seawater at the very right, least. Right, right. Not that it's like pond weed. But even then, I think weed should be reserved for the vascular plants. Yeah, but isn't a lot of pond scum just pollen? That's it's not even like bioactive. It's just pollen that has drifted onto the surface of the lake and doesn't no, no, break the No, no, I mean like the little the green water. circles. You know the little green circly ones. Like yeah, lily pads. The things no, that frogs hop around. Pads. Those are lily pads. <laughs> just just describe like an algae thing that's little. Like Volvox? You know, I don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm we don't know what that blind. is, Matt. Well, they're, yeah, they're, those are, they're, they're, I would call those algae, but tomato, potato, I guess. Okay. Oh, I, I have another question. Are okay. tomatoes and potatoes the same thing? <laughs> same family. Okay. Yeah. Asteraceae? Mm, Solanaceae. 
Solon AC, no! Why did I get that wrong? Have you seen oh, the, man, the, I love the, you. the... Thank you for coming on the show, showing up <laughs> Ryan with all his Latin knowledge. Have you seen the, uh, the, have you heard of at least the ketchup and fries plant? Oh, it makes both potatoes and tomatoes? Right, so someone has figured out how to graft a tomato top onto a potato root bottom, and uh, you get both on one plant. I don't know how well they do, but that's pretty yeah, I was going to cool. say, it's, I mean, I always understood that climatologically there's a reason that there's a potato-tomato line across Europe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it's definitely something that's meant to be pampered in a container. And even then, I can't imagine if you're producing giant root tubers and giant fruits that uh, either would get the, the benefit of the doubt, I guess, in terms of resources. So you might just get sad versions of both. Yeah, I don't know why you would want to take, like, I've got two plants that produce two separate things, and they need to make sure that they're getting enough nutrients that they can each produce the best version of that thing. But what if I just put them together? <laughs> You're bad. It would be like saying, like, like I need I need a bicyclist, but I also really need somebody who can bench press a lot of things. So let's just put them together the and hope time. that I get. Yeah, you're yeah. just a bad capitalist. I think uh, that that person made Sold. a lot of dumb money on that. <laughs> Tomaco. Tomaco. Exactly. At least that has addictive properties. <laughs> that's a, so that's a weird way to episode. frame it. <laughs> um, so Matt, you are joining us because uh, In Defense of Plants is joining the Braculote Media Network. Indeed, I am, and might I say, it's an honor to have been invited. Thank you. Yeah, we're super stoked about it, and you know, uh, we can't promise a ton of benefits, but we can promise that you'll be coming on this show occasionally to talk about plant stuff, and uh, we're just going to generally be working together to make both these shows, as well as the Titanium Physicist, Cough Cough, as great as they can be. Excellent, man. Well, I, again, I just like hanging out, so I appreciate being around you guys, whether it's virtually or in person. For sure. That's the sweetest thing anybody has ever said on this show. It's weird that it had to be me, the misanthrope. <laughs> well, it's also weird that, like, you you explicitly pointed out hanging out virtually, and then Ben, who we've long theorized is a artificial intelligence in a garage in Canada, was like, oh, yes, saying that about my virtual life is very kind of you. <laughs> it is. It's so kind. I validated him. Let, let's, talk about, let's talk about neutron star collisions. All cool. right. I'm really excited about this story, Ben. Can I tell you that? Everybody. Are you? I am. That's fantastic. So the news is GW170817. It always sounds like, I don't know, uh, a license plate. Um, but the thing is, this news, uh, the event, uh, these numbers are, are code for when it happened. Um, so GW stands for gravitational wave. 17 stands for 2017. 08 stands for the month, uh, which is August. And sure. 17 stands for the day. So something got detected by the LIGO interferometer on August 17th, 2017. Okay, I got <laughs> it's it. It's hard it's a palindrome. Or, well, I, I guess not pure palindrome, but palindromic. Right. If only it happened on the 88th month, we'd totally be boned. Um, <laughs> so, Damn our rotation. So the, uh, <laughs> here's the thing. The thing is that I have like four different interesting stories, narratives that you can draw through this explanation. Because unlike the previous LIGO discoveries, this one is absolutely bonkers and fairly complicated. Okay. So, uh, can I, can so, I make a suggestion? Yeah. So Matt. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of throw you in the deep end, but I think you can handle it. Okay. We often designate a person in a segment as the dumb idiot who just asks the questions that the listener is probably asking. Perfect position for me, uh, especially when we're talking about something extra planetary. Right. So I'm going to say, even though I know you probably know a lot of theoretical physics and this is probably not a big deal for you, uh, yeah. maybe just whenever Ben says something that doesn't make sense, you just throw a big old time out on the field and uh, ask him to explain that deal because i like totally know what he's talking about but i'm just gonna pretend right that's yeah. all i'm asking you to do is to pretend totally, totally. and then i'm gonna throw out my one issue that i took with the article ben sent so there's already been like a number of papers published right ben lots and lots and lots of papers published yeah. but the article you sent us was a new york times article by uh, dennis overby 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 i think overby is correct and 
Uh, there's a video. It's a very nice video animatic that shows kind of the, the animation of how this happened. I found it very helpful. Except for the yes. first line of it, Ben. Which was? In the age of the dinosaurs 130 million light years ago, or 130 oh. million years ago. Right. So, Ben, let me tell you about dinosaurs. <laughs> yes. There's this group called dinosaurs. They, uh, modern day, live on all seven continents. Uh, they can fly. They can swim. They can run at like 50 miles an hour. They have giant social groups that can fly around in the sky. Some of them can speak English. Uh, they're right. pretty good at using tools. They mourn their dead. But, you know, right. 130 no, million okay. years ago. So what heyday. you're talking. Hey, hold, hold on. What you're talking no, about are. are Autobots and Decepticons. Correct. And uh, some of them are dinosaurs. Dinosaurs in disguise. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But not all of them. And that's not that's we're talking about meat animals here when they say in the age of the dinosaurs, 130 million years ago. Here's what I'm not, asking. Not about. robots in disguise. Yeah. The next time you go to your physics conference where you yes. and all the other physics robots talk about physics, I would just ask that. If we could just start pushing the agenda that at least one branch of Dinosauria is alive and well to the point where they can literally speak English and we can have conversations with them, I would be a happier person. Okay. Didn't you That's just invent the plot to the 90s sitcom Dinosaur? <laughs> yes. or, or Jurassic World 3. We're not sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Waiting for that to happen. Dreading. Yeah. Waiting yeah. for that, like the collision of two neutron stars. So Ooh. anyway... Age of dinosaurs, uh, dinosaurs alive and well, doing do, doing very well. You could have a conversation with one. They might say they want a cracker, but that's still talking directly to a dinosaur. <laughs> right. The end. OK, that's all. Sorry. I, I, I mean, I, I like, do you think we're not... still in the age of the dinosaurs? Because I have a friend called the atomic bomb <laughs> who introduced something called the age of the atom that we currently live in. I think. Birds exhibit a greater latitudinal range and certainly, uh, maybe not certainly, possibly a greater biodiversity than mammals. Hmm. Yeah, I know, but we it's the age of the atom now, Ryan. The age of physics, the age of technology, computers. Birds You're sounding a lot like some sort of anti-X-Men propagandist, <laughs> as if the children of the atom are not worth your consideration and we need to build sentinels to destroy them. Yes, Mike what Pence. Of it? Oh, I've, no. made, I've made my 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 opinions on these issues known. <laughs> Fair enough. That's a discussion for a different time because I really want to dig into as much as we can uh, this this really awesome discovery. Okay, so uh, choose a number between one and four. Three, eight. Okay, so let's talk about gold. No, where gold oh, came from. man, I regret my decision. Immediately. Okay, choose another number between one and four. Let's just talk about what happened. Why no, don't man, because there's like four different angles and you got to choose which which narrative you want to hear. Well, which They're ones all are you, totally awesome? Which ones are you going to cover on Titanium Physicist? Freaking all of them one day. But right now you get to hear whichever one you want. One to four. Choose. OK, OK, hang on, hang on. I, OK, I didn't. I was going random. Oh, Matt, choose a number between one and four. I'm going to go with log into one because my... I'm guessing that's the beginning of the narrative. All Does right. nobody so... have a D4 available? Hang on. Roll <laughs> Let's talk D4. about four. Does, does an international dice collaboration of scientists. I like that. To... People, okay. people, people is... getting along across borders. This is one of the most amazing stories. Ben, I rolled a uh, D four and it came up three. Well, Matt chose one, and he's the he's the new the new host, so uh, he already chose <laughs> new dumb. Okay. Plus, you took you already took three, and you took it back. Well, I that so, wasn't uh, that was my gut. That wasn't a legitimate roll from an online dice roller. It was the same number. Okay, so Matt, <laughs> hey. the deal is that the LIGO interferometer it it measures gravitational waves, right? So okay. anytime you get these uh, black holes colliding or neutron stars colliding somewhere within the observable range, we can use this LIGO detector to measure the gravitational waves. It's a big interferometer. And the big news a year and a half ago was that they had detected gravitational waves generated by black holes colliding. And that was fantastic because it validated a bunch of theories. It validated Einstein's theory of general relativity. It validated all the work and money spent building this enormous pair of interferometers. Have you guys done an episode on how interferometers work? 
on your show, Ben? Yes. Which it, yes. Do you know which episode? Here's what the my question is, is You're being rude to how do interferometers work? <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean? No. Okay. What does it mean to detect a gravitational wave? You've d- you've just chosen the zeroth option, <laughs> surprisingly. In the beginning. <laughs> Changing gears to the zeroth option. A gravitational wave comes from the theory, Einstein's theory of general relativity, which says that space-time is dynamic. We're not used to thinking of time intervals and space intervals being dynamic. We're used to them being, like, set in stone. The distance between me and that chair is always going to be three meters, and it'll never change because I'm never moving from my current <laughs> position, and nobody's moving that chair. That's going right? to get gross quick. But, sure. um, but in Einstein's general relativity, <laughs> he explains gravity as being caused by changes in the distances, changes in time intervals, and we describe this as the warping of and, or curvature of space-time. So... One aspect to his theory is that if a massive object accelerates, it will generate a gravitational radiation, essentially. But these aren't particles moving through space-time like a gamma ray or a, or a beta ray. Well, like a photon, right? Yeah. These are, these are, these are uh, waves in space-time. And so when they pass through us and around us, they cause distances, intervals of distance to change. What? Okay. That's insane. Yeah. Weird. So that's so weird. Uh, they're very, very, very subtle. The if, if gravitational waves pass through us from a from a Big Bang collision, say, I think it would the the stat everybody uses. There's two. One of them is that the distance between us and Alpha Centauri would only change by the width of a human hair. Huh. Uh, another distance interval that we use to describe it is that the distance between us and Pluto would only change by the width of a proton. That's it, huh? Yeah. So almost nothing. You so that 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 thing that's way bigger than an electron, <laughs> you know, by orders of magnitude. Yeah. So, um, so what they do to measure these things is they build these big L-shaped. Well, they're called an interferometer. An interferometer doesn't measure. Uh, distance or time or anything like that. It measures interference. Makes interference sense. between waves. Okay. So like, so wait, 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 wait. Boss. Yes. Sorry. I'm not, I'm, I, I promise I'm not trying to be difficult. So when we say an interferometer, it is a metric of interference, just that in the same way that a thermometer is a metric of thermic, you know, thermo. Thermometer. Yeah. An interferometer is a machine that, that measures interference. Okay. Uh, you can use them in regular life to do things like detect uh, vibration or detect subtle changes in, in length scales. Um, but in these ones, uh, they take a laser light and they split it in two. And they send one laser beam to the north and one laser beam to the east down this long corridor. It's it's like two kilometers long or ten kilometers long. Uh, it's <laughs> kilometers long. Anyway, so the laser beams bounce back off mirrors at precisely set distances and then they come back to where they started and they get combined, recombined again. And light, because it's a wave, will interfere. And so these two light patterns will, these two, these two light beams will interfere when they're recombined. And so the deal is that the interference pattern that you get will be slightly different depending on how the arms, how the length of the two arms compare. That's pretty great. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So what they're doing is if a gravitational wave comes through and changes a length scale, it'll change the length of one of these arms and the interference pattern will change. Holy cow. So it's almost like it's almost like setting up two guitar strings that are both supposed to be E's in opposition to each other. And then if one of them suddenly is a different note, you know, you've detected something. Yeah, they'll sound slightly out of tune. Wow. That's so cool. It's amazing that someone yep. invented that. <laughs> Yeah, sure. In fact, we've been using interferometers to test Einstein's theory of... uh, In fact, uh, an interferometer measurement was used to uh, inspire Einstein's theory of special relativity. That's the one that says that time passes differently depending on how fast you're moving. So uh, physicists and interferometers go way back. We're best buds with these machines. So the deal is that, like, like I said, the signal here is really, really subtle. Sure, it, it can cause a change in interference pattern, but only a, a very, 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 very slight one. And 
we're on Earth. There's lots of sources of vibration and like thermal noise or even like vibrations from these machines are so sensitive. They can one one significant source of noise for them is waves hitting the continent and shaking the continent slightly. Wow. <laughs> that causes noise that they detect in the LIGO machine. What a weak continent. If this had awkwardly happened at the same time the earthquakes hit in Mexico, like the, we might have missed it. Yep. Wow, yep. what a scary thought. So, uh, the, the, so one, so uh, the, 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 a lot of the technology goes into, uh, of LIGO, goes into trying to isolate it from noise. So, you know how like noise canceling headphones yeah. work? Yes. Where they play the inverse of a, of a sound wave to cancel it out. Mm-hmm. There's a little bit of that going on where they, they actively measure. Some of it is them just trying to measure the sound around it to try to cancel it out from the data. But one of the big sources of trying to filter out noise involves building two of these interferometers. And they're on opposite uh, okay. sides of the continent. I, I read that in the article, but it wasn't clear why that was important. Uh, yeah. So I'm glad you brought okay. that up. Yeah. One of them's in Washington. And the other's in Louisiana, Washington State. And so if a gravitational wave comes through, it's going to hit both of them almost simultaneously. But there's going to be a slight lag between when they measure their signals because of the transit time. Because, you know, it takes light. A, the speed of light takes a certain amount of time to go from Louisiana to uh, to Washington. Right. Hurry it up. Slow poke. Right. And so what you can do is you can say, well, we think we have a signal at one place and you can go look at the signal from the other place and see if they match. And if they, they aren't coincidental in the right way, you can say, oh, it's probably just noise. That's wow. so cool. OK, so this was the machine they used to detect black holes. I mean, it's still on, but the big black hole collision uh, that they measured two years ago. Uh, the thing that uh, Weiss, Barish, and Thorne just won the Nobel Prize in Physics for, uh, that's that's just this machine. But it's not... Okay, back to storyline one. This machine <laughs> isn't supposed to exist on its own. It's part of an international collaboration. So since then, they brought on a, another interferometer online. This one's in Italy. It's called the Virgo Collaboration. And LIGO and Virgo are, are friends. They're working together. But LIGO is a lot better than Virgo. Uh, its arms are longer. Its, its technology is slightly better. Uh, and so LIGO is more sensitive than Virgo. So anything li- they detect on LIGO, they'll also detect on Virgo. But they'll detect some things on LIGO that they weren't detect on Virgo. So uh, two weeks ago, there was a big announcement of a uh, measurement of, of, of uh, black hole collision. I, I don't know if you remember that. Uh, part of the part of the news of that story is that the Virgo detector had also detected it, and they used the Virgo collector detector and the two LIGO detectors to figure out what part of the sky the black hole is from to to a much higher degree of accuracy. So you can narrow it down based on when and where it hit. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's like imagine there's a cricket in your room. Uh, it creaks once. You're like, where'd that come from? If there's two or three people in the room at the same time, you can kind of triangulate where the cricket is. Right, right, right. So it's like telemetry. That's right. Exactly. Man, you're really making me wish I hadn't replaced the battery on the smoke detector in our building because otherwise we'd be <laughs> getting a chirp every couple of minutes. And it would really. Oh, I hate that. That's the worst. I like how it doesn't do it. Like it. Yeah. Anyway. OK, so it would have hammered home your point, Ben, is the point. <laughs> One of the big angles on this story, one of the things that makes it really newsworthy is how it worked as an international collaboration. So first thing, LIGO detected GW170817, but not Virgo. Ah, Virgo. Virgo wasn't sensitive enough to measure it. But what that means is we can tell that wherever it happened, it's beyond the range of Virgo. So that kind of tells you how far away it was. Wait, pause. Yes. So... LIGO is a system that encompasses the detectors in both Washington State and Louisiana. That's one system. That's right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's that's one system. That's all I wanted to know. Um, So the fact that Virgo didn't detect it, uh, they were able to use that to, to kind of pinpoint where in the sky the signal had come from. Just because they Virgo didn't hear anything and they know kind of how Virgo's antenna, what areas of the sky Virgo is sensitive to, they could tell kind of where it came from. So because the three locales were all measuring and because they could compare the data, they knew kind of exactly where to look for this thing. That's incredible. 
that they detected. So Virgo, Virgo's yeah, yeah. inadequacy I mean, is useful. <laughs> oh yeah, no, that's right. Uh, and you know, um, they're going to bring Just more. Replace Virgo with Europe, and now you know how Matt feels about international collaboration. Whoa, they're bringing more gravitational wave interferometers online. But this is only part of the story. Here's the real cool bit. LIGO, the LIGO collaboration then told pretty much every telescope on Earth to go look at that patch of sky <laughs> because they said, hey, let's see if anything came of it. And indeed, there was. There was it, it's, it's something called a kilonova that was observed. Okay. What the hell is a kilonova? Right? How is this the first time we're hearing about kilonovas? <laughs> Uh, they're kind of new. They were named in 2010. We've been doing this show since 2009. This should have been our front page yeah. story, Ben. I, I, a thing I read today told me that there have only been two measured kilonovas ever. But define kilonova for me. And, right. Okay. So kilonova is a name for what you see when uh, two neutron stars collide. So it's like it's like a it's kind of like a supernova. It's it, it gets it's a it's an air, it's an explosion that gets really bright for a couple of weeks and then dims out. But correct me if I'm wrong. Doesn't a supernova produce a neutron star or a brown dwarf or, or something? Yep. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, supernovas produce uh, neutron stars and they also produce black holes. Ooh. And they also are big explosions in the sky that's brighter than a galaxy. Long story short, it got bright. A little place, a little star got really bright, bright enough for the telescopes on Earth to measure. And so because they were pointing that way, all of the telescopes on Earth in all the bands, infrared, uh, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope saw it. They saw it in radio. Uh, they saw it in gamma rays. Uh, all the bands took really good measurements of exactly what it was that had produced this LIGO signal. Yeah, I love collaborations. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. So part of this news is that LIGO is more than just a thing that detects black holes and everybody goes, hooray. It's now part of an international collaboration of astronomers, and it's doing astronomy. It's giving us useful information when and where interesting things are happening that the rest of the world can then collaborate with and get more, better, more interesting data. So that's storyline one. Love it. All right. Great. Matt, Choose another story. No, uh, we do not have time. <laughs> if oh, come people, on. No, we don't. I'm sorry. If, if people want additional storylines and if they are excited by the prospect of learning about astrophysics, where can they go? Ben? What's that? Where can they go? Well, we, I, we don't have we won't have a titanium physicist episode on this for like another month. Yeah, but I'm saying if come they on. were excited what about the story prospect like? of... No, we don't have time. We don't have time. Oh, come on. It's a podcast. What, what are we going to get run off the air by uh, as it happens? We're going to get run off by me ending the recording, and we haven't recorded a full show yet. <laughs> like, <sighs> I know, I know. I'm, I'm super excited about it, too. This is not a time reduct thing. This is not like a me... I didn't just... even talk about... I didn't even talk about gold. I know, I know. It's I'm I, I'm not trying to be difficult, but it's we've talked about this for a half hour now, and we simply have to move on. And I want people to have the opportunity to go learn more. So where can they go on the internet? I don't like by the time I don't just say I'm trying. Uh, Titanium physicist is going to make an episode about this, but uh, probably in a month or two. But if they're excited about theoretical physics in general. Write to Ryan Hoft and tell him to murder the timer duck. I didn't use the timer duck. I retired the <laughs> timer duck. The timer duck is dead. I'm just. But how do you know time has passed? Huh? <laughs> All right. <laughs> is it time to talk about Picas? No, I have to drink this. It's time to talk about what are you drinking? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Uh, Ryan, are you ready? Ben, I thought the yes. Lego story was great. I, we can, if you want to come on next week and just do storyline one and then two and then three. We can keep doing this. No, it's, it's fine. I don't care. I'm just doing drama for the podcast. Ooh, Ooh. I'm just, I'm super mad at you. See, this is what you learn. Oh, I'm sorry. When you come in on a, on a, on a group like this, you learn, you learn how people work together <laughs> or don't <laughs> <laughs> or it's just conflict. Resolution. Well, Hey Ben, you know what I've been thinking about recently? What's that? I think, I think physics is pretty cool, man. 
Oh, it's so cool. I love physics so much. Even when it's hot. And I hope you do too. hot things are hitting each other. Mm. They can still pretty oh, cool. Yeah. That's the thing about physics. The best part Everything's relative. of the video from the New York Times, because the worst part we covered was their misunderstanding of, of dinosaurian evolutionary timelines. The best part was when they talked about a tiny neutron star orbiting inside the gaseous cloud of a larger star. Oh, yeah. Do you that know why cool. that's bonkers? I mean, like, that I don't, had to happen. We, we don't have time. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, like you, you get so, one, you get one free. <laughs> go. We've already told story one. OK, um, no, no, it's OK. Let's skip it. But it's true. That happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, uh, the, it, so the two neutron stars in this case collided. Um, and to do that, they need to be close enough so that they're emitting a substantial amount of their energy in the form of gravitational waves. And to get that close, so in other words, they're really, really, really close to each other and orbiting at almost the speed of light. And to get that close to each other, you know, each each neutron star formed as the result of a supernova. So once upon a time in this system, there were two, uh, you know, supergiant stars that were going to go supernova. And supergiant stars aren't all that close to each other, not close enough to make like substantial amounts of gravitational waves. So what have to happen in this case is the one neutron star had to get swallowed by the other one. So the other one would put a lot of drag on it and cause its orbit to decay so that they could get close enough when the when the second one blew up. Ah, oh, geez. Okay. That hurts my head to think about. Yeah, no. So dense that each pound weighs over 1,000 pound. I, I can tell you story number four. Do you want we to hear story number four? We do not have time. Oh. We've already, so we're good. way past time. Ben, we're way past time. And what I need to collide with right now is my beverage. And that's what's coming in the next segment. And that's what's coming up next. Yay. I'll be right back. We chart our courses, but I'll always collide we stumble from the wreck wait for the rescue to arrive they put out the fire but the smoke never clears it's a blanket of lies getting thicker by the year i'm not the rolling stone i've got a glass of my own But I won't pretend I was wrong when I'm not the one to blame Well, it would not be an episode of Science Word if we didn't also talk about what we are drinking. Ben, you seem super excited about what you're drinking, so I'm going to ask Matt to go first. All right. <laughs> Well, I am not drinking a brand tonight unless you consider my lab mate a, a brand of beer, but he made a delicious Oktoberfest. My buddy Ron Salemi, if he's listening, uh, delicious, delicious beer and was very kind enough to share it with me. So that's what I'm drinking tonight. Nice. How is it? It's good. It's very crisp. It's very refreshing. And uh, I don't know if I have the, the, the palate yet to say, yeah, this is an Oktoberfest, but I'll believe him. I mean, Oktoberfest, I feel like is a beer that if you don't get done properly you'll taste that it's off even if you don't know that if you don't know the exact flavor profile you're looking for i feel like you'll still taste that it's not quite right just in that it doesn't taste quite good you know what i mean so if it tastes like you saying crisp is already i think a great descriptor for a well-made beer for an Oktoberfest. good well there you go ron you made a good beer good job ron way to go ron yay ben Okay, so Bethany and I subscribe to Japan Crate. Hey, Japan Crate, sponsor us. Okay, so <laughs> that's what it's called, right, Bethany? Yeah. Okay, okay, hold on. All right, so uh, Japan Crate. And the deal is they send you, like, <laughs> snacks from Japan every month, and sometimes they send you a drink. So several months ago, and it's been in my fridge ever since, we got a Poco Sapporo brand pudding drink. Now... Japanese pudding is just their word for flan. Flan? Flan. 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 
So if this is a drink that tastes like flan, and I get to drink it right now, and I've been waiting for this moment my entire life. Oh, Certainly my the entire life. <laughs> this could be man. so good or so depressing. Mmm. Mmm. I think they just took a flan and blended it. It's got chunks of flan in it. Oh, God. <laughs> oh it's delicious. <laughs> oh, that's no, rem- so good. Oh, that's awesome. Good. I'm glad. <laughs> oh, yes. It tastes amazing. My life is complete. As a lover of mm. flan, I'm really curious. Mmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they should sell these in stores. They're so good. <laughs> <laughs> okay I'm, I'm done drinking all the flan okay ryan what do you was it, it's, it was worth the wait what do you yeah it was worth the wait mm, it tastes like all my hopes and dreams come to pass oh, this is a beautiful moment for us is it it's a beautiful moment pleasure to share it with you <laughs> is it <laughs> i don't know is it <sighs> all right bethany oh wait no ryan <laughs> <laughs> I, for one, like that you confuse me with your wife. <laughs> I think that speaks to our it. relationship. I think that it, it says something about where we're at. And, I, and, and you know, we, we did live together for a couple of days in a hotel room in San Francisco. Yeah, you so. heard me snore incessantly. And you know what? You were very polite about all my snoring. You, you, didn't, you didn't keep me up. I was asleep the whole time. Magical. This Seriously, you never woke, you never woke me up once. You're literally the first person who's ever shared a room with me since I was six and never sa- had said that. I didn't use the earbuds you gave me. I kept them to give <laughs> to future hotel mates of my own who might have been bothered by my snoring. <laughs> All right, I brought you earplugs. You did because you're a, <laughs> you're a generous and kind person. Yeah, that's a good friend right there. <laughs> ben is a good friend. And he brought me a hockey puck and hockey tape. That's tradition. Oh, yeah. That's right. It's tradition. <laughs> That's what I said. Tradition. <laughs> tradition. You guys give me a lot of songs. Give me a lot of songs. Dishing them out. Uh, I'm having a drink. What are you drinking? Right. My drink is in reference to something that hasn't happened on the show yet, but will happen later. Dun dun. Right? Dun, 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 dun. Are you drinking a live episode? Are you drinking a beer called 300th episode? Oh, Ben. It is not a beer. Are you drinking a cocktail called, um... No, it comes from a Special conference? Paleo conference? Paleo pal conference? comes from a bottle. This is me pouring it. It's a cider. What's it called? Can I, can I make one more guess? Sure. Is it a cider name? It's a cider. Mmm... What's it named? It's named. Uh, it's named. I'll oh, give you. I'll give Brachio, you. I'll give you a hint. Nope. Nope. Brachio I'll give you a hint. Conference. Brachiolope 2018 conference. <laughs> it's it's the common name for a type of bird and a geological feature. Mm, seagull rock. Flamingo nope. volcano. Hawk knob. <laughs> Ooh. What's an? Mm. <laughs> do, do we <laughs> want to go down that road? <laughs> I don't think What's we do, a, but I'm glad what? that Ben almost walked into it. <laughs> What's the future reference of Hawk Knob? It, no, it, that's not. Okay, ben, <laughs> we're doing a future. It's the next episode of Science Sort of about hawks and knobs. No, it's this episode you'll see in a minute okay. because I'm going to explain okay. what this is. This is a wild fermented traditional hard cider, seven months bourbon barrel aged. And it is from the Hawk Knob. Cidery and Meadery in Lewisburg, West Virginia. Yeah. Famous for their mountain mamas. So I picked this up on a recent trip back to my home state of West Virginia, and uh, it just looked really good, and it had a good price point for the ABV, and I thought it would be a good thing to have on the show. So I'm drinking it now. Hometown pride. Uh, yeah. I like it. And it's funky. You know me, Ben. You know I like things funky. It's true. And this is... It definitely tastes like apples, but it's not too sweet. But it's also not too vinegary. It's like a perfect balance of kind of just funky apples, clearly wild fermented. I, it's not clear to me. I'm, I'm just saying that. <laughs> clear. It's very good. Yeah. I actually do like the oakiness that comes from the bourbon barrels. It's it's very good. Thank you, Hawk Knob, for... Thank you, White Oaks is more like it. Right? Right. First use, 
What what char level do you like on your white oaks, Matt? Uh, geez, now you're asking technical questions. That I, <laughs> I just like white oaks because they got those TLCs that keep the the delicious fermenting beverage in the barrel. You know. Yeah, I mean, clearly the char for the barrel would have been decided by the bourbon distillery that the barrel came from originally. So it's not like Hawk Knob is is demanding certain char levels. It's that's the bourbon distillery they're sourcing from, right? That's just how that works. You get what you get. Yeah. Speaking of getting what you get, let's talk oh. about tiny mammals going extinct. No! Get it. Coming up next. Our second and final story of the evening, final because of its finality, is that climate change spells extinction for the pikas of Lake Tahoe. No. Pikas, pikas? Pikas. I just learned that, so if that makes you feel any better. That it's pikas or pikas? That it's pikas. I've been saying it wrong for literally over a decade. Well, there you go. Yeah. So it is definitely pikas. Yeah. Pikas are a lagomorph uh, mammal. It's a bunny. A small bunny. Yeah, it's a little bunny with around ears. So lagomorphs refer to anything within the taxonomic group that includes the uh, lep- lepidora, which are the hares and rabbits, and the okonod- is it Ocon- okotonidae, which are the pikas. Hmm. Yes. Uh, sure. Is it <laughs> ocho? Tonidae or Okatonidae? Are, aren't all CHs in Latin the K sound? Right, that's yeah. why I'm confused. Yeah. I'm confused for a great many of things, but they're the broad group Lagomorpha, which Lagos is the Greek for hair and morph is form or shape. And so rabbit shaped animals. Yeah. <laughs> and buddies. then uh, that is the sister group to rodents, uh, Rodentia, and the group that comprises both. Lagomorphs and rodents are called gliers. So that's the taxonomy. Interesting. Right. But lagomorphs are better. But soon we will have one less branch to worry about because we are we as a human species are killing them to death. Discuss. No, we're just killing the ones in, in the south. And yeah, we are. We're, we're not even directly killing them. We're just removing their habitat. Yeah. That, <laughs> that, OK, so pikas uh, of what I know of them are an ice age species uh, that really proliferated during the Ice Age because they like it cold and they like eating, like all their habits are really kind of built around living underground during the winter for a long time. So they, they build these little hay, pa- hay bales and they dry all the flowers on the mountain and then they bring them into their little caves and then they just eat, you know, dry flowers all winter. Anyway, so they proliferated they're all over the world they're in um you know there are tibetan pikas <laughs> there are pikas in europe there are pikas everywhere um but when zero pika when the ice age ended they got kind of stranded where the weather is still ice agey which means mountaintops so they mostly live on mountaintops now in really really high altitudes where it's cold and they can't take the heat so with global warming, uh, the mountaintops farther south are too warm for them and they're going to die out because pikas don't migrate because they're stuck on their mountaintops. Yeah. Well, they could migrate latitudinally if they hadn't restricted themselves altitudinally on montane alpine environments. Essentially uh, island yeah. in the sky. Right. I have a really sad story. I don't know. I don't know if you should publish this. You can judge whether or not you can publish this or not. Oh, good. Kind Give of me a, things to edit. Thanks. It's kind of a hearsay <laughs> story, but it's great um, and also sad. I have a friend who's a biologist, and one of his right supervisors, 
I'm when the right supervisor here. was an undergraduate, got a research project up in Alaska or the Yukon. Um, and the question was, how do pikas migrate? Like, how often do they move? Do they change mountaintops? Do they, you know, do they move into new habitat? And so his job as a researcher was to eliminate all the pikas in this one mountain or chain of mountains. And so he'd put out peanut butter and he'd shoot them with a shotgun. What? And then they discovered through this study that pikas don't migrate. Uh, and so, so he killed all the pikas and they didn't ever repopulate. He sanitized the mountain of pikas. Yeah. Damn science. Isn't that like the scariest science story you've ever heard? Yeah, as soon as you gave me a gun and say, go shoot that thing, if, it, if it's not invasive, I don't know if that would be, uh, I'd be like, well, time to rethink my career choice. <laughs> yeah, it's probably the 60s, but I can't imagine shooting a pika. Nah. Matt, you kind of mentioned that doing the plant ecology that you do, you've actually thought a good bit about how some sci- how sometimes the altitudinal effects can affect the big picture of biodiversity. Yeah, yeah, this one hits kind of close to home for me because I, I do... A lot of my, well, all of my research in the the Southern Appalachian Mountains, which are are not nearly as tall as as you know where where Tahoe sits, but still, you know, this idea of species being pushed up and off the mountaintop with nowhere else to go is, is quite real, and uh, you know we're seeing evidence of it plenty in plant communities. So to hear this about the pika is just another, you know nail in the coffin for montane ecosystems in terms of ecology their ecology as we know it right now but like what's the what's the big picture here like how do we so let's talk about, okay actually let's take a step back and let's talk about the the study that was published the study was published in plus one and the title is apparent climate mediated loss and fragmentation of core habitat of the american pika in the northern sierra nevada california usa uh, first author, Joseph Stewart, uh, who's at University of California, Santa Cruz. So go slugs. <laughs> and <laughs> they what they did was they observed a small patch of land in the Sierra Nevadas, and they observed a significant, if not local, extinction of pikas in that area, and then extrapolated that out to what that means for the broader region and correlated that with increasing climate change. And the thing that I thought was cool, cool. Uh, oh man, it's weird. Uh, that it's, it's, no. it's difficult to cool is a temperature, a, temp, a temperature thermo thermic term. But what they realized was, is that as temperatures warm in these regions, Pika's can't go out during the day to forage because it's too warm for them because they're such like tight little bundles of thermal conservation, right? Yeah. That if they go out during the day to forage, that increases their body temperature to the point where they can overheat and they have to avoid that. They can't overheat because that's bad. So they stay under the rocks. They stay under the ground during the day because they live above the tree line, right? So they're up above where there are trees. And so their habitat is essentially this extreme mountain environment where they live under rocks, giant rocks, like talus piles that you would have a hard time hiking over. So we move them out of the way to make hiking trails for humans who like to go hike in these areas. And they would scurry out during the during the day because they need to go out during the day because that they can also see the predators that might eat them. And they go out during the day to collect plants to then hide back under the rocks to eat during the winter when it's all just covered in snow. Yeah. And so if it's too warm in the summer, they can't go out and actually collect the food that they need to survive the winter. And that's the great irony. And that's pretty that's tragic kind of when you think they're like hiding under the rocks, slowly starving to death because it's too darn hot for them. Right. And I apologize that it took me such a long time to make that point. It, <laughs> I could have made it quicker. I just failed. But uh, like, <laughs> because they're diurnal, they come out in the evening and the morning. So... Like, like sharks. Yeah, like sharks. Yeah. The sharks of the mountains. So why would they, like, like during the afternoon, you don't really see pikas that often. I know because I try to find them and I can never do it because I'm only lazy enough They're to They're really to hard to see. Afternoon. You have much better chances of seeing, like, a yellow-bellied marmot. Oh, man. No. See, the thing about pikas is if you're in an area with pikas, um, they're not afraid of humans. And 
Why would they be? Their instinctual response to any threat is to call it out because all their elder predators are <laughs> yeah, ambush they're chirpers. Predators. They chirp. Right. I've definitely heard yeah, that. They go. Beep, beep, beep. I mean, so their name is wait, an wait, onomatopoeia. What? Wait, I'm just going to say at this point, I, as a good podcaster, <laughs> I'm going to drop in the sound of what Pika's actually sound like. And you can compare it to what Ben just did. Sweet. Yeah, no, and everybody's applauding now because my uh, yeah they go ee, 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 right. Um, I can't tell. The so uh, yeah, the uh, <laughs> the the, uh, the the long and the short of it is, uh, if you're around Pika's and they see you, they will start shouting at you. Um, they they're not quite telling you to go away. They're telling you that they see you and you can't sneak up on them. And so when you're hiking around Picas, you can you can hear them before you can see them. So if you hear that, it sounds kind of like a bird call. But if you learn to recognize it and you hear it, you can stop and look around and you'll see them hopping around yelling at you. It's the best. They're really cute when they yell at you. There's there's another element of irony here that uh, I don't know if you guys are aware of. But the fact that, you know, this is an issue of climate change and we can use... Wait, are you saying that climate change is real? I'm suggesting that uh, it might be. Um, <laughs> You're suggesting based on every single line Literally of evidence? Literally every single line of evidence that wasn't uh, funded by a uh, big oil think tank, but I digress. Uh, so, <laughs> in trying to reconstruct vegetation uh, in, in old climates in these mountain-type habitats, a lot of times people will use old pika caches uh, with their dried plant materials. They're essentially mountaintop herbarium keepers. That is the kind of thing you would like. <laughs> hmm, I like that. As I'm going to tell Bethany about that later. Sweet. <laughs> or she could just listen to the show, Ben. Yeah, but then she'd have to hear me be stupid twice. Your significant other There's listens to There's only so much of what I can take. Anyway. I, <laughs> uh, they're natural herbarium keepers, which I imagine, like... You know, pack rats seem to take only certain kinds of vegetation and build up a giant nest, which I know is still useful. But do are pikas because they're operating in different habitat or because they have different selective preferences? Are they doing something distinct and and useful? Ooh, good question. I don't know. I'm actually going to have to look into that farther. But I would assume you're probably getting a good snapshot of whatever you know the dominant vegetation is that they're feeding on at that time. So, like you said, it's somewhat useful. You're not getting a complete picture, but you can kind of detect these if there's a no analog community that used to be there. You know, I have another peak effect that might be helpful for you. Sweet. Even though there are poisonous plants, picos will still pick them and dry them. Because the poisonous plants, uh, their poison kind of wears out midwinter, and so they can, uh, they've can they got a longer shelf life. And so they pick all the plants. They pick all the grass and the flowers regardless, and then they cash them away. So, nice. yeah, you'd probably get, probably get a pretty good cross, cross-selection, cross better than just like an animal that was only foraging for one specific plant or two. So they get everything. Here's another question then, and, and if it doesn't already exist, here's a free dissertation topic for the listeners is, do you think they could be picking plants that might keep uh, pests at bay, like an aromatic herb that would, you know, keep the pika fleas out or something? That would be cool to look into. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, there's relatively fewer bugs up at that elevation, though. True, 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 true. Because you're dealing with an oxygen gradient and... All that other st- and and a thermal gradient, which is why you such you see such weird pollination mechanisms, by the way, uh, in in alpine plants. Yeah, that's that's totally a topic of discussion. Is <laughs> there? I mean, I assume you see more wind pollinated, wind selfing. Uh, birds get brought into it every once in a while. Uh, yeah, there's some. Oh, speaking stuff. of birds, let's talk about the role that pikas play in the food chain. Let's do it. Owls, hawks, coyotes, and weasels rely on pikas as a food source. So these guys disappearing is sad for a lot more than just pikas and pika lovers. It's sad for, I mean, I also imagine them like dragging organic plant material into the substrate is probably helpful in terms of creating the fertilizer for the next generation of Uh, plants. yeah. Yeah. Arctic foxes do it, right? Why not? 
They do, yeah. right? And these are these are essentially the Montane, maybe not <laughs> totally equivalent, but they're the Montane versions of that sort of same thing yeah. of dragging, problem. just moving biomass around in ways that is probably useful in the long term. Right, concentrating it in these dens, which I assume they reuse year after year. Yeah, hmm. yeah. So, uh, and then they also, they're providing food for mesopredators that are keeping the whole kind of food chain going. And so the, it's, it's just, it's bad to kill these things. And I don't know why this is an argument we keep having to make. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's so bad. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it is tragic. And, you know, you get a lot of people, at least uh, general public kind of questions, you'd be surprised at least, maybe not, how many times I get, well, what use is it? What use does it serve? And it's, again, it's just part of this wonderful tapestry that is ecology but you know it's like the gears in a clock the more you knock out the less you're going to be able to accurately do what it's intended to do plus ben likes them yeah and yeah they're my really favorite at the core of it he likes so few things no, i would like I'm to grumpy. see that in a grant proposal ben likes them and he likes so few things fund me <laughs> i mean you could say su- Maybe we need to start including like a how to cite this episode in the bottom of our show notes <laughs> <There you> go. <laughs> I actually kind of like that. I want to see the look on the PI who has to deal with their first uh, proposal that has a podcast cited in it. Thomas, start including how everything gets cited at the bottom of our show notes. Thank you. Oh my god, you can have an EndNote template and everything. It probably yeah. exists. Yeah. And and that's uh, by the way, not Tim. Tim's the audio guy. Thomas is our web guy. I want to make sure that Thomas gets credit for being the web guy. Okay, cool. Thomas, Tim Tom. Get it. Thomas. That's don't don't conflate them, Ben. <laughs> Just because you can't tell the differences between white male humans doesn't mean there aren't differences. Are Ooh. you sure? Ooh. Damn. I mean, I, I've only met one of them in person, so it's possible that Thomas is just Tim when he puts on some sort of cunning disguise. <laughs> but I wouldn't put it beyond Tim to have a cunning disguise. No, I believe Tim has a cunning disguise. I don't necessarily believe that it also means that he's Thomas. Can I just tell you the most mm-hmm. exciting thing about becoming part of this network is all the personal mystery attached to it. Tim? But I mean, are we, are we doing okay? Yeah. Wait, all the personal mystery attached to who? Uh, the fact that you guys have all these mystery people that you have never quite met in person. I bet I met Tim in person. Oh, okay. Well, then forget what I just said. <laughs> yeah. Who haven't I met in person? But Matt's, but Matt's not wrong. No, he's, <laughs> he's right. I mean, you're an AI in a garage in Canada. Tim Tom yes. could be the same person with a cunning disguise. Right. It's just Correct. a mystery. I suppose. I, I, want, I, now I want Tim and Thomas to both have business cards that say, Tim Tom, <laughs> I'm in a cunning disguise. Scienceorder.com. Well, only yeah. one person can pay for it, so send your money to... No, how do you do the money zone thing? I mean, we do have you want to move to the next yeah. topic where we can talk about that more <laughs> easily? Sounds like a transition. Is there any sort of Pika rescue agency we need to be supporting? If not, there should be. Get on it, listeners. No, you know, uh, some environmental groups were trying to make the Pika the spokes animal of global warming, but I don't think it ever caught on. Polar bear took that. Yeah. yeah. All right, here's what I wanted to say to wrap up this segment. Point the first... Climate change, definitely a thing that's happening. Yes. And it's happening in a direction where things are warmer than they used to be, which for sure. turns over animals like pikas. Also, not great for bats. And plants. And plants love each other. <laughs> if you or someone you care about knows about a great pika conservation organization, please get in touch to the show. We have a contact form on our website. We also can be reached at paleopals at scienceworld.com. And if you also have a Montane Alpine plant conservation organization you're a fan of, let us know about that, too. And me. Us. I said us. Us. Yeah, that's yeah, true. This is, this is the first time you're the us of us. It's true. This is the, see, I'm still getting no, it's used fine. to it. It's fine. We're all, we're all friends <laughs> here. It's going to be great. Let us know so we can promote it on a future episode. Sweet. All right. And if you do let us know, the odds that you letting us know will end up in the next segment are high. And that next segment is called The Paleo Pow. Okay, now play a Pikachu song.
Paleo Pals, a segment of the show where we deal with feedback from the listeners. So if you've said something to us in a feedback style, it is our turn to feed it back to you in the form of a podcast, which is what's happening right now. And we're going to start it off with Ben because Ben is being punished for his connectivity insolence. Okay, so my Paleo Pal is a guy named Richard A. How is this happening oh my again? God, why does his name do this to us? <laughs> Some what sort of the ring situation. Why don't you do this, pal? <laughs> Ryan. Filling in for Benjamin Tibbet. Uh, Benjamin Tibbet's Paleo Pal is a patron thesis for our friend Richard H. And uh, Richard is a donor at the Avogadro's Army level, I believe. And he, at that level, has earned the right of a thesis title in his name. And that thesis title, Matt, is usually something that is developed based on the topics that we talked about in this episode. So if if we can somehow synthesize neutron star collision with peak extinction, we'll be in good shape. So so what do you got for us, Matt? Uh, geez, this is a lot of pressure. Uh, the end of no, 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 I mean we're we're working together. We're working together. So it's like neutron star collision predicts peak extinction. The Radiation from neutron star collisions heats the Pika's habitat. Sonorous? Let's see. So Yeah, radioactive warming gradients as a function of Pika food source distribution. Uh, Something like that? Ne- Something like that? Neutron star leads to Pika paucity. Sonorous frequency emission to sonicity between star and lagomorphs. <laughs> we got we got words. We got we got some words there. Oh wow. I'm just gonna include like I don't maybe the Ben's local recording is gonna record that perfectly, but we got <laughs> very little of that and I'm just I'm really excited. Sorry. Your for, local for one got it. Yeah. Oh, but it, it doesn't really help the conversation <laughs> if, if we didn't. Um, how about how about like like uh, lagomorph collision due to resource constriction at an altitudinal plane is analogous to neutron star collisions in intergalactic space? Rapid climate cha- anthropocentric climate change effects lead to a collision of habitat suitability and pikas. This is no neutron star. There's a hyphen in there, or colon. <laughs> or, or how about the sociological implications of Ben Tippett's favorite things vis-a-vis uh, the th- tragic end of the world? Whoa. But where do neutron stars come into that, Benjo? They're some of my favorite things. They're implicit in the end of the world. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, we're getting there. We're getting close. Spell it out. I use the there. phrase vis-a-vis. Don't know that I've ever seen that in a scientific paper, yeah. but fine. <laughs> Colloquialism. Can we, can we get some sort of gravitational wave increasing the distance of habitat? Oh, oh wait. Oh, I got it. Okay. Okay. How about gravitational wave interference increases the habitat fragmentation distance amongst Picas? Yeah. Which which induces higher extinction potential in alpine populations. Sources of acoustic noise uh, for gravitational wave detectors in regions with high alpine talus slopes. Pika's trigger LIGO, What they won't trigger it once they're extinct. The snake eats its <laughs> tail. We discovered gold, where gold comes from, but lost pikas. Pika's. It wasn't Ooh, worth it. Wait. Oh, okay, Matt, you're on to something here. Okay, so like reverse 49ers, <laughs> neutron collisions, increase amount of gold, but ultimately decrease amount of picas. The end for lagomorphs. In the Sierras. The I like that. I think we got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think that that's good. Neutron star collisions, increase gold, ultimately decrease picas. The sad story of alpine pikas in a warming climate. The thesis. Boom. <laughs> the thesis. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, it's it's hard to come up with a new thesis title every week. <laughs> I can barely do it ever. So yeah, good job. 
You just have to throw some math jargon words in there, like diffeomorphism constraints among lagomorphs. No, diffeomorphisms, lagomorphisms, and uh, sonorous emissions. That's hashtag bad psycom. <laughs> well, well I'm, I may include some of those words in the final thesis for our friend and patron subscriber, Richard H. And in doing so, it will force you all to go to the website, scienceword.com, to see that final thesis title. And maybe even go to patreon.com slash science sort of to see what kind of reward level we're at and how you might be able to contribute to us doing the show. Hey, speaking of patron, I know this is a lot of like asking for money on one dense thing, but uh, Ben, Matt, where are you guys at? Uh, hey, hi. Hey. Please, please give us money. Yeah. What? What's going on? I need money. I'm poor. I was giving you guys both the opportunity to plug your Patreons. Okay. I aren't aren't the other papers. Okay, sure, sure. Uh, I'm at patreon.com slash in defense of plants. Help me cure plant blindness by keeping my podcast on the air. Uh, and uh, I get paid every time I make a titanium physicist episode from Patreon. So like once every two months. It takes a long time, you guys. <laughs> Organizing physicists to get together in a room and record a podcast is really hard. <laughs> I'm with you, man. With Everybody's you. always canceling. Ugh. Can I, can I, uh, I'm going to add one additional caveat. Sure. Yes. Uh, Matt, I hear you had some issues with the iTunes uh, review system. Uh, yeah. So iTunes replaced my podcast during the month of June with uh, the Newport Folk podcast, which is, you know, that's a good podcast, but also a ton of religious podcasts, which I don't subscribe to. And everyone, unfortunately, had to download that, and I had to have a whole new feed get created. So I lost literally all of my reviews, which totally sunk my recommendations on iTunes. Um, slowly building them back up, but it'd be really great if anyone enjoys the In Defense of Plants podcast to go and uh, say so. Or just tell me what you think in a tactful, non-troll-like manner. Yeah, so appreciate that we took advantage of Matt in a moment of desperation where he needed to do <laughs> iTunes reviews. <laughs> Okay, I will no, that's not you. that's that's not why we invited you onto the show. We invited you on the show because you're a uh, excellent scientist podcaster, and those are the kinds of people we are seeking out when we are building our our, our meager yet fierce network. Well, thanks, guys. Again, it's a complete honor to be part of the network. I'm really excited for all the things to come. Hey, speaking of things you're excited to talk about. How about the uh, the email I, I sent your way? Yeah, yeah. Let me pull that up here. Or unless you have it readily available. I do, but I'm going to make you pull it up because Ben couldn't do his own thing, so I'm not going to do yours for you, too. <laughs> all right, all right. I get it. You're an independent man, and I'm an independent man, and we're going to... I know I just want it to be evenly distributed in our independence. I dig it. All right, so Xander O. emailed you guys and said that they really enjoyed... Episode 260, Flame On, they enjoyed your interview, and what struck them was that how much can happen when the climate warms half a degree Celsius in temperature, uh, and in terms of forest fires in the area of study, that said that they blew their mind, they would like to hear more about how small changes in temperature can have large effects, because they feel like the average person, a person has a difficult time grasping very small or very large numbers, which is very true. Uh, and they said that they were struggling to accept global warming as a real thing in the past, but have since kind of come around because they, you know, did some research on their own, which is really cool. Good job, Xander. So essentially, uh, you know, one degree on average increase doesn't sound like a lot, but apparently, uh, they're surprised to learn that one degree can cause a lot of different things, which is, it's, it's, it's a really good point to bring up, especially in the way we talk about climate change, because obviously there's still some skeptics out there deniers are they skeptics deniers, yeah. deniers. sorry deniers. yeah i caught myself but the listener uh the right in xander there did bring up a good point talking deeper about this what does it mean when you say the global average changes one degree and why why does that sound or why should that be more threatening than it sounds it's a good question it's a really good question maybe the global climate like degrees or by a million <laughs> micro degrees <laughs> ben you're breaking up Oh, badly. Well, okay. Here's the problem with trying to measure things changing on a global scale. You know, it's it's no neutron star, but Earth is a big place, right? And to 
get away all of that variability and topography, like, you know, being up in the mountains versus being down here on the plains, uh, you kind of have to do some some ironing out of some of the, the noise. So when, when climate scientists are talking about mean global temperature, they've removed a lot of that spatial variability, and that makes a very reliable expression of the global surface air temperature. But what you have to understand is it's always going to be a mean. So you can have very large numbers that have very minor sounding means. Well, means are also pretty uh, not great when it comes to accurately expressing spikes, you know, right. outliers. Right. They, they tend to over or under express outliers or underliers, if you want to think about it in a above or below sort of way. But I think the thing that maybe is missing from this conversation is when we talk about a single degree of temperature rise, we're talking about an enormous amount of energy. Very, very big numbers. And so there's a lot of energy that comes with raising an entire planet and its atmosphere and its oceans and its landmass by a degree. A degree feels like an insignificant amount when you just hit your thermostat and ask it to go up or down a degree. But when you're talking about the entire <laughs> matter space of a planet, that's a lot of energy. It's serious, serious changes. And when that energy is being caused by a single organism's actions. A little messed up. Like we, we have some responsibility yeah. there. Just as the cyanobacteria had the responsibility for making Earth's atmosphere an oxygen-rich atmosphere and killing the anaerobes, we are warming the planet. You're talking, you're talking about the uh, the great oxygenation yeah, effect, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the oxygenation extinction. Yeah. Although... Uh, yeah, I love pointing that out to people, that, like, we exist because a different organism made the atmosphere have oxygen. Right. Which is kind of... It's it's humbling. It's humbling. A thing we take a little for granted. But uh, you know, Ben, you're a physicist. You're good at math. Um, like, do you have a, a, a comment or an idea on how like, like small initial changes can lead to big final outcomes? Like the thing right now is that this is a matter of public relations and not a matter of mathematics or science. Like the science is settled. We've we've had we've had uh, concrete, easy to understand, uh, persuasive arguments in favor of doing something about climate change since I was a little kid. Since the '80s, people have been on television talking about this as a real thing that's happening and being able to explain it to a kid. If they don't get it now, then it's not it's not a matter of them not getting it because the 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 message is poorly understood or poorly explained. It's that there's a cohesive counter propaganda campaign that's being, uh, that's being run by a whole bunch of people who are complicit in selling the general public, the idea that everything is fine and the earth isn't heating up. I'd say with it, I'd say that it, the best thing we can say about this is that it's almost time to get out. Madame la guillotine. Very true. <laughs> Settle these things once and for all. <laughs> Like I've got <laughs> France, France revolution. I don't know. It's just so bad. <sighs> yeah, it's so bad. It's so bad, though. Ben. But to go back to what Xander was talking about, I mean, to kind of get at some of these these one degree equals a lot of weird things. I mean, think of just outside of fires or hurricanes, just rainfall events. Right. I mean, this can you don't necessarily see a change in if you're going to get 100 inches of rain a year. Yeah, you might still see that region get 100 inches of rain a year, but what might end up happening is instead of getting an inch a day for 100 days, suddenly you get 50 inches in two days, one set of the part of the year, and then 50 inches in two days, and that drastically changes the whole biosphere. I mean, okay, for another instance, when we saw a similar peak warming about 1 to 2 degrees Celsius warmer than we're seeing today, about 9,000 to 4,000 years ago, uh, the prairies overtook much of the East Coast and expanded all the way out to the Atlantic coast. So that's big in terms of small changes, seemingly small changes, making uh, large drastic changes to, to continents and global scales. Well, I sort of feel like it's if you, Matt, a person who understands plants better than I do, gave me a plant and said, give this plant 
on average, a gallon a month. And so on day one, I dump 128 <laughs> ounces of water on this plant and then leave it alone for a month instead of giving it 4.2 ish ounces a day. Like, how's that plant going to do? It ain't going to do. <laughs> yeah, it's probably not going to do great. Let me, let me tell you from experience how it's going to do. They do really poorly. <laughs> then they die and then you have to throw it like a plant in all this dirt. <laughs> it's very sad. Right. And yeah. so I know it's it I know that it sounds like we're talking about small changes over a large expanse of time, but this is a paleontologist and ecologist and a physicist all talking, and we're all telling you that on the time scales we work, this is happening way too fast. Yeah, yeah. I, and so either you believe us or you don't. Either you say, Oh, it's happening on a fine time scale, and we say you're wrong. Or you saying this is natural and we say you're wrong or you say, oh, this is actually happening too quickly. And we say, oh, you agree with us. Let's fix this problem. Yeah, it is kind of frustrating to spend all day operating in a realm where everyone gets it. And then to hear someone, you know, like my aunt at the Thanksgiving table, that's definitely going to happen this year, say, yeah, well, the scientists aren't sold on it. Heavy sigh. <sighs> you would be hard pressed to find a bigger breadth of disciplines than two ecologists and a theoretical physicist agreeing wholeheartedly on a thing <laughs> because we care about a tiny lagomorph that lives in the Alpine mountains of our shared continent. That's right. That's a very good point to make there. So if you hate Ben and want Pika's to die, the <laughs> end. The end. The end. <laughs> I don't Imagine know if you just like, cut it there and like, <laughs> if you could. <laughs> oh no! Wait, we actually, I, I, I right. kind of built this on purpose because I had kind of a positive note to end on. Okay. All right, so I really wanted to end things on a high note, and so uh, we got something we haven't gotten in a while, and that is a voicemail, and so. To end out the show, I just want to listen to a really pleasant voicemail from a friend of ours, and we're going to listen to that right now. Hey, Paleo Pals. My name is Josh. I live outside of Roanoke, Virginia. Um, I have really enjoyed listening to your podcast. I've listened through almost all of them, caught up to 226. So, getting close. Anyway, I have heard a few of your live shows and you guys should definitely come to Roanoke, Virginia. We've got some awesome craft breweries. Ryan, craft brews, really good stuff. Um, there is a place called Soaring Ridge Craft Brewery and they hold a um, basically STEM talks. So they have people come in and do a talk. Um, I think it's once a month, give or take. And so yeah, guys, look into that. It would be awesome. Really, really enjoy the podcast. I've listened to all of it. I started out listening to titanium physicist and moved over to um, collapsed wave function and actually finally ended up listening through all of um, science sort of and have tremendously enjoyed it. Anyway, thanks. Keep it up. Bye. Uh, yeah. So first and foremost, this is why I had a West Virginia craft cider on the show this week. Suck it, Virginia. <laughs> You told them. But also that message was really nice and it warmed the, the cockles of my cold dead heart. <laughs> Hopefully not to the point where the heart pika, pikas are, are, are no longer happy. No, they're no longer foraging for food, Matt. Ah, damn. I've, I've not had anything from Soaring Ridge Craft Breweries, so feel free to add it to my list of things that I need to try if Patrick doesn't get to them first because he actually lives in Virginia. But... I really appreciate the voicemail and it sounds great. And maybe we need to plan a trip to Roanoke. I don't know. Hmm. Maybe it's time to try out the, the in defense of plants podcast. Yeah. Come check it out. It's got something for everyone. So you don't have to be a total botany nerd to enjoy it. My pitch other than curing plant blindness one episode at a, at a time is just celebrating the fact that plants are indeed living, breathing, sex having fighting organisms that are as worthy of celebrating as any vertebrate i mean i don't know that i can agree with that but <laughs> if you do and you end up listening to the show let me know that i'm wrong boom uh you want people to appreciate the world of plants which is a big deal because i don't know about you but i eat plants every day 
I eat them every day, and so do all the animals you care about. So, in one form or another, in one form or another. What about lions? Oh, they eat the right. zebra. One form they or eat another. The, <laughs> they eat the grass. Right. Yeah. Uh, so where it. where can people go if they would like to learn more, if they would like to contribute, if they'd like to help out, what can they do? They can go to indefensiveplants.com. They can go to facebook.com slash indefensiveplants. They can go to youtube.com slash indefensiveplants and check out our new yeah, video YouTube series. videos, yeah. man. And so that's the thing is I want to point out that, you know, you're joining the Bracket Loop Media Network, but we don't impose any sort of content restrictions on you. It's all about like you keep doing your thing. You're just part of our umbrella of we're all promoting each other. We're all on each other's team. Yeah, I like that. That's my kind of team. So we want you to keep doing what you're doing because you've been doing a great job. But we just we just want to be tied to you. We are the parasite to your success. Yeah, no, let's all be parasites on this giant organism that's called science podcasting. Yeah. In the brachiolope. I mean, the brachiolope is clearly being parasitized by whatever organism is mimicking moose antlers on the top of its head. <laughs> it's a fungus that we all are made of. Ben, what are you doing, man? How are you living? Okay, uh, I host the Titanium Physicist Podcast, and it's great, and it's physics. If you like the physics that we talked about for a brief period of time on this episode, tune into my generic episodes where we talk for an hour about it, and it's fun. A brief period of time. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, long story short, also we also have experts who are smarter than me and guests who are more interesting than me. And the smart people talk to the guests. And once in a while, I interject with a bad analogy. <laughs> so it's fun. First of all, uh, your show's great. So s- stop underselling it. Thank you. Anyway, thanks for listening, everybody. Wait, I had other things. Uh, What was I going to say? So as we wrap up, you know, you guys both promoted uh, the podcast that you're on. Uh, Sometimes I am given the opportunity to guest on other podcasts. And uh, I was recently on The Thing Minute, which is a podcast hosted by Harper Harris that discusses The Thing minute by minute. And I know you're all probably used to me plugging my minute by minute podcast, but it's the month of Halloween And I'm talking about a horror movie, so that's great. Cool. The Thing, the story of ecological interactions going poorly. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, we're talking John Carpenter's The Thing, right? Yes, correct. Oh, yeah, that's like the ultimate invasive species. It is, it is, because they even do a a model, a computer model, which in the 80s was a big deal. I got those scenes, Matt. I got the computer model scenes with Wolf of Remley. Oh, that's the best scene of the movie. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, those are my scenes. I got those five minutes. Yes. Where he's just staring meaningfully at a computer. Oh, that's beautiful. Running a animation, I'm sorry, I mean model that he totally (laughs) wrote. (laughs) To describe the spread of the the thing, the it. Today it's us, tomorrow the world. 73% of the world, yeah. So I got to discuss those minutes. It was really fun. I had a lot of fun with it. Please go check those out. I'll put the links in the show notes. I will put the links to the Titanium Physicist and In Defense of Plants in the show notes as well. And uh, thank you both for joining me. Thanks for having me. Oh, uh, yeah. All right, bye. Sword. What? Bye. <laughs> no, wait. Oh, you're right. Ben. Ben's correct. Uh, next time, we'll also discuss some of that general class of principles that we call science. Sort of. Hey, Matt, you got to go sort of. Okay. You got to do it sing song like that. All right. Sort, sort of. of. All right. They'll fix it in post. Yeah. <laughs> Auto tune me. Auto tune me. Visit sciencesortof.com for show notes, links to all the stories we talked about, and ways to interact with the hosts, guests, and other listeners. Science Sort of is brought to you by the Brachialobe Media Network of Podcasts, with audio engineering by Tim Dobbs of the Encyclopedia Brunch Podcast. That's all for this week. See you next time on Science Sort of. Play a song where all of the lyrics are just Pika. Yeah. I want to be the very best like no one ever was. Dun, 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 dun. To catch them is my real test. To train them is my cause. I will travel across the land 
Searching far and wide. Bum, 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 bum. Something is something, something. The power that resides. Pokemon. All right, done. Sweet. That was beautiful. Okay, so no, my no, paleo pal. No, 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 sir. We, uh, no, no, no. We, no, no, no.